Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Counter Threat, Finance, and Sanctions, David Payman, thank you for joining Voice of America's Persian Service. Thank you. It's great to be here with you today. So not many people may know much about your role. What can you tell us about what it involves? Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Counter Threat, Finance, and Sanctions. Um, under my division, there's two offices, the Office of Sanctions Policy Implementation, which oversees 25 sanctions programs for the State Department. We work very closely on a day-to-day -day basis with Treasury and the Office, office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, um, to both implement new sanctions, uh, advise the Secretary of State and our special representatives uh, that, that are uh, responsible for different countries on sanction strategy going forward, uh, new sanctions going forward, for example, in the context of Iran and our maximum economic pressure campaign, as well as providing Treasury and the Department of Commerce foreign policy guidance on all licenses. So whether they're export licenses from Commerce, specific licenses, from the Department of Treasury, we ensure that those licenses will meet U.S. foreign policy objectives and provide guidance either approving them or denying them as necessary. Those are very impactful because some of these licenses have implications, great implications for companies and economies around the world uh, in the millions and sometimes billions of dollars. And so in addition to that, one of our key roles is to interface and interact with our government partners overseas and also the private sector. And part of it is educating uh, both governments and the private sector on sanctions, advising them on where we are today with respect to our sanctions policies and where we may be going in the near future from a policy perspective, but also importantly, to engage actors, whether it's governments or private sec sector individuals or entities to curtail behavior that may be uh, in violation of U.S. sanctions or in violation of uh, the spirit of the sanctions and U.S. policy and, and national security concerns. And, th and that is, I think, where we have a tremendous impact. So one of America's uh, biggest partners is the European Union. And uh, the EU just launched uh, in January a mechanism to allow EU businesses to bypass the U.S. financial system while trading with Iran. Uh, what response have you seen to Instex so far from EU businesses? Every indication uh, I'm receiving is that there's absolutely no interest to utilize a European financial mechanism to do business with Iran. The fact of the matter is that there is no interest from the European private sector for any business ties with Iran. We've seen over 100 European companies exit the Iranian market. Uh, I've been to Europe. I've been to several countries in Europe. I've spoken with uh, very large industry groups, uh, different businesses in the private sector, and there's absolutely no appetite. There's no appetite for two reasons. The first is responsible businesses also have a very responsible and clear moral compass. No one has any appetite to do business with a regime that sponsors terrorism, that's responsible for killing Americans, that currently holds American hostages, but as importantly for European companies, nobody wants to do business within Iran that only last summer and last fall was committing acts of terrorism on European soil. And I'm referring to the plot to place a bomb in Paris and the assassination attempt uh, in Denmark. And so the European companies are well aware of that. So that's one reason why there is no interest. The second reason is companies make an independent business decision based on their own cost-benefit analysis, whether they want to maintain a relationship with Iran or do business with the United States. And they've made the choice that they would rather do business with the United States. They'd rather use the U.S. dollar. They'd rather use the U.S. financial system. They'd ha rather have business ties with U.S. companies. And so that was an independent business decision they made um, bearing the consequences of violations of U.S. sanctions. Well, how concerned are you that some businesses in Europe might still make 
uh, decision to go into the Iranian market using this mechanism and what is the administration doing about this uh, INSTEX system that the EU is trying to uh, get up and running? So obviously to the extent there is any appetite by anybody to use this financial mechanism, we'll be tracking it very, very closely. Those companies will be looked at and scrutinized very closely. Their ties to the U.S. financial system will be looked at. Their use of U.S. banks will be looked at. Their use of non-U.S. banks that have ties to U.S. banks will be looked at. Um, and we will look at any potential violation, direct or indirect, knowing or unknowing violation of U.S. sanctions laws, and will vigorously enforce all violations of U.S. sanctions. And I should just add as well, there's also no appetite because the fact of the matter is, my understanding is that th this mechanism will be used to conduct humanitarian trade. But the United States already allows for the provision of humanitarian aid, food and medicine to the Iranian people. And so there's a clear mechanism that can be used through U.S. financial institutions with uh, guidance from OFAC and full transparency to OFAC that any European company can, can utilize. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask about the humanitarian aspect of the uh, U.S. sanctions policy. There are exemptions in there from the U.S., but some critics of the administration have said that in spite of these exemptions, uh, international banks that could facilitate humani humanitarian trade are afraid of running afoul of other aspects of the U.S. sanctions and not actually approving these kinds of humanitarian transactions. Have you seen any, any evidence of this phenomenon? Well, I, I have not personally, but I would say to the extent that there are concerns by financial institutions with respect to potential violations of sanctions or ensuring that they're compliant with all of our sanctions, OFAC is a tremendous resource. And I know OFAC uh, uh, answers these questions on an almost daily basis. So to the extent a financial institution or a company interested in exporting food or medicine to Iran um, is having challenges doing so or wants further comfort, I encourage them uh, to go to OFAC and to seek responses on very, very particular uh, transactions, and they can also come to my offices, the Office of Sanctions Policy and Implementation, and we'll be able to give potential foreign policy comfort or otherwise ensure that a response from, from OFAC will be forthcoming. Uh, can you provide any examples of uh, how um, these U.S. exemptions have enabled humanitarian aid to actually get into Iran? I mean, I mean absolutely. I mean, we are very sensitive. Um, to the challenges faced by the Iranian people. And the intent behind our sanctions is not to punish the Iranian people. It is to incentivize and to change the decision-making by the regime to address the 12 specific points raised by Secretary Pompeo um, last May. And so we're not asking any more or any less from the Iranian government um, than we ask from other responsible countries around the world. And our sanctions are directed towards the regime and towards uh, ensuring that there's a change of behavior uh, from the regime. And so with respect to the provision of humanitarian aid to the people, that's something that is of great importance to this administration, to Secretary Pompeo, to Special Representative Hook, to myself. And we're ensuring that those humanitarian channels remain open and, and food and medicine is getting uh, to the Iranian people. Well, another aspect of uh, the U.S. sanctions policy on Iran is uh, targeting the Iranian oil sector. I'd like to know what you think will uh, happen with the waivers that the U.S. gave to eight governments to keep uh, importing certain amounts of Iranian oil when those waivers uh, expire this May? Well, I can't talk about any ongoing deliberations uh, with respect to the waivers uh, uh, in the future. Um, what, what I could say is the limited waivers, first of all, 20 countries didn't get a waiver. They stopped importing Iranian oil. The very limited waivers we provided were to countries that uh, proved to make significant cuts um, to, uh, with respect to Iranian imports, 
and they did so. Um, and, and they were also facing some technical challenges to get to zero imports uh, by November. But our full expectation is for all countries to get to zero as fast as possible. I wanted to ask you about uh, how Iran has been reacting to uh, the sanctions that have been, been imposed so far. Um, Iran has said it will rely on its own resources to sustain its economy. Uh, what actions have you seen Iran taking to try to evade the U.S. sanctions? With respect to evasion attempts, um, we are closely tracking ship-to-ship -ship transfers of oil to evade our oil sanctions. And we're working closely with foreign governments to ensure they're monitoring ship-to-ship -ship transfers off their coast. We're following the ships. We're going to hold ship owners responsible for ship-to-ship -ship transfers. We're going to hold ship managers responsible for ship-to-ship -ship transfers. We're going to hold insurance providers responsible for ship-to-ship -ship transfers. Mortgagees we're going to look at of these ships and hold them responsible. So if you are engaged in evasive action, which is the really worst kind of violation when it comes to U.S. sanctions, to evade our sanctions, um, we will hold you accountable. And it's, it's not limited only to the ports or the ships, but we're going to take a very broad approach and we're going to make sure we enforce the full breadth of our, of our sanctions. I should say on that note, countries have taken very responsible measures to address the issue of Iranian exports of oil uh, and attempts to evade U.S. sanctions and the, US, uh, the, 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 the use of oil um, for facilitating terrorist activity. I was in Panama uh, not too long ago to meet with the Panamanian government. And Panama um, signed a, the president signed a directive um, to immediately pull their flag. Panama has one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, flagging registry in the world. So they signed this directive to pull their flag from any ship that is facilitating um, or contributing to terrorist activity. And as a result of that, uh, 60 Panamanian flags were withdrawn from Iranian ships. And it was, it was an important step for Panama. It was recognized by Secretary Pompeo. But more importantly, Panama really led the way for other countries to follow suit and to pull their own flags and for other countries to commit to the United States that they will not re-flag those ships um, that the Panamanians withdrew their flag from. And so we've gotten tremendous support from many countries around the world that provide flagging services, uh, that have major ports, to ensure that there's full compliance with U.S. sanctions and there's no attempt by the Iranians to evade. Lastly on Iran, what would you say to uh, critics of uh, administration policy who say that the sanctions just aren't strong enough because they haven't yet specifically targeted Iranian leaders, businesses, and uh, other assets? There is an immense amount of corruption in the regime. Regime figures are corrupt. They're stealing the people's money. They're stealing the people's money to line their own pockets. And they're stealing the people's money to sponsor terrorism abroad. Instead of investing in employment in Tehran and in Esfahan and in Shiraz and in Kerman Shah, they're taking the money from their economy and they're supporting Arab terrorists abroad, Hezbollah, gets more than $700 million a year from this regime. Palestinian terrorist groups get more than $100 million from this regime. Iran has spent $16 billion in the last few years to fund its proxy war in Syria, which has led to the deaths of hundreds and thousands of, of innocent civilians, and to, to sponsor Houthi rebels in Yemen. So there's a lot of theft uh, going on by this regime from their own people money be that belongs to the Iranian people. We're well, well, we're, we're well aware of that. And as part of our maximum pressure campaign, we are looking to, to expand uh, the scope of our sanctions. And I think uh, the world community, the private sector, foreign governments, and Iran should expect an expansion of our sanctions. Secretary Pompeo was very clear when he said we're going to have the strongest sanctions in history against Iran. By definition, that means that the sanctions that were reimposed as of November are only the start. They're the floor, they're not the ceiling, and there will be more to come.
Can you share anything about uh, what kind of timeline we can expect for these kinds of measures? Unfortunately, I can't get into specifics with respect to timeline, but I can say we're actively uh, looking at the issue and, and Iran can expect to see more sanctions unless they immediately change their behavior, come to the table, and address the 12 points that were raised by Secretary Pompeo. And, and what are those points? Those points are stop funding terrorists abroad, stop funding wars in Syria, um, stop your pursuit of ballistic missiles, and ensure that you have no nuclear weapons. There was a treasure trove of documents that was recovered from central Tehran last year that conclusively proves that while the current Iranian president was declaring uh, several years ago that Iran is not interested in pursuing a nuclear bomb, indeed the Iranians had a very sophisticated program to obtain a nuclear bomb. And part of the JCPOA, the problem with part of it, is that the inspectors don't have access to all Iranian facilities, including military facilities, that could be used to conduct research and development of a nuclear weapon. And so as long as Iran addresses those issues and obviously releases the current um, U.S. hostages and, and stops its malign behavior and acts like any other responsible country, um, uh, we can have potential, a potential breakthrough here. Well, I'd like to move on to another topic, which is Venezuela, another country subject to U.S. sanctions. Uh, the Trump administration has been tightening sanctions on Venezuela in recent months, uh, targeting the state oil company, PDVSA, and also uh, the um, disputed president, Nicolas Maduro, and his allies. What impact have you seen uh, from these sanctions so far? So there's been an immense impact. The, the, the flows of revenue to the regime are being cut. Um, you saw the, the events that occurred a few days ago with respect to the, the blackout in Venezuela. Um, the regime is under pressure. We have tremendous unity around the world with respect to our policy. The United States has led the way forward um, to hold Maduro accountable and to ensure he's no longer in power. And the legitimate president, Guaido, is, is, is recognized by over 50 countries in the world. And we have tremendous unity in South America with our European partners. We have transatlantic unity on this issue. And so there's been an immense amount of pressure put on this regime. Uh, how concerned is the administration that uh, reducing Venezuela's oil exports, uh, given that Venezuela is such a, a big producer of uh, oil, could uh, affect the overall supply of oil in the market and thereby possibly also complicate U.S. efforts to get Iranian oil exports down to zero, considering Iran also is a big oil producer. Sure. I, I think there is there's a healthy supply of oil. One of the priorities uh, for this administration is to ensure a continued healthy supply of oil to ensure price stability and obviously those two considerations are taken into account when we implement new sanctions including the sanctions against Venezuela. We're comfortable that there's going to be a healthy supply of oil and there's going to be price stability. U.S. Uh, companies are, are rapidly increasing their output of, of energy products including oil. And so there's going to be more, I think, output in the near future uh, from the United States. Um, and I think we've, we've achieved agreement with our partners abroad to ensure that there's pl price stability and sufficient supply of oil on the market. And, 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 to, and to ensure that countries get to zero as fast as possible um, um, with respect to any potential continued importation of oil in the next several weeks. But the U.S. doesn't necessarily want Venezuelan exports to go to zero, or does it? Well, the, 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 the policy objective is to ensure, with respect to our sanctions, is to ensure that no money, no revenue is going to be flowing to the Maduro regime. And, and that's, the, that's the intent behind our sanctions, whether it's in the oil sector or other sectors. Um, moving on to uh, Russia, um, a U.S. Treasury official, uh, Segal Mandelker, uh, said this week uh, to Congress that uh, the Trump administration has sanctioned 270 uh, Russia-related individuals and entities in the past two years. Some of these sanctions are aimed at uh, achieving specific changes in Russian behavior, for example, getting it to 
um, abide by a ceasefire in Ukraine, and other sanctions are aimed at uh, imposing costs on Russia uh, for pursuing certain policies like alleged meddling in U.S. elections. So I'd like to know um, how much uh, success you've had so far with these two different types of sanctions. Have you had more success with getting specific changes in Russian behavior or uh, just imposing costs on Russia? I think both. I think, and I think they go hand in hand. So the immense costs we've imposed on Russia and on Russian oligarchs that are close to the Kremlin has created f fissures uh, uh, between the relationships uh, or among the relationships in Russia uh, and between the oligarchs and, and the Kremlin. And as well, uh, we are implementing these sanctions not only to increase the cost, but to uh, induce a change of behavior. And in that respect, we have tremendous transatlantic unity with our European partners. Uh, we had it in 2014. Obviously, we're no longer in 2014. Russian malign behavior has increased. You mentioned election interference as one example. And so as malign behavior increases uh, by Russia, sanctions by the United States will increase and we will closely align with our Euro European partners um, to, uh, to ensure that there is a force multiplier effect with respect to our sanctions and enough pressure is maintained on Russia to hold it accountable uh, for its malign behavior. Can you detect uh, any changes in that perceived malign behavior so far? Well, look, I think there's, there's been some areas of mutual interest and cooperation between Russia and the United States, including in the, in the, in the, in the Syria theater. Um, Russia has an interest to not have Iranian troops uh, on the ground there. So there's been some discussions um, and there's been some indications, I believe, from Russia um, that there is no desire to have Iranian troops on the ground. And so where there's areas of cooperation, we continue to have dialogue and, and uh, seek to align our interests with, with Russia and, t and to work together. Uh, but obviously in areas, Crimea, uh, Ukraine, election interference, um, we need to see positive changes from the Russian government and from the Kremlin uh, before we consider at all any change in our sanctions policy. Well, I'd like to end by looking at uh, a bit of your personal story. Um, what can you share with our audience about uh, your family roots uh, in Iran? Well, I was born in Iran. Uh, I speak Farsi. Um, it was important for my parents to speak Farsi with me in the home, and I'm glad that they did. It's a, it's a beautiful language, and I'm very proud of having been born in Iran. How would you say uh, your Persian roots uh, shape your approach to now, you know, having to impose sanctions on the country of your birth? You know, I think there's no one on earth that understands better than the Iranian people themselves in Iran the need for sanctions and the need for the regime to swallow the bitter medicine of sanctions in order to finally change its behavior in order to start acting like any other responsible country in international affairs and in order to finally reinvest its tremendous resources and the revenues they could generate from those resources back to their own people, the Persian people. And in that regard, um, um, I'm, I'm quite, quite proud of the work um, that we're doing under the president, under Secretary Pompeo's leadership, and under Secre uh, Special Representative Hook's leadership. Well, you've been in the role of uh, DAS for just over half a year. Um, how do you feel about what you've achieved so far, and what more uh, do you see coming uh, ahead? Well, as I mentioned, we're responsible for over 25 sanctions programs, and uh, it's a lot of work. And I think we've made great progress in many areas. I think sanctions were, were responsible for bringing uh, North Korea to the negotiating table. I think our sanctions uh, in Iran, despite uh, reports to the contrary, are multilateral in effect. The entire world, in terms of the private sector, is fully compliant. Uh, or almost fully compliant with our sanctions. As I said, 100 European companies have come out. There is no real appetite from anywhere else in the world. Countries uh, in South America and Asia and in Europe as well 
are, are speaking to us about our sanctions, wanting to understand the implications and to comply. And so even with our European partners, while we have differences over the JCPOA, we have unity to respond to Iranian acts of terrorism. And I actually have a quote um, to, to crystallize the kind of terrorist activity by Iran against its very own partners, the Europeans and the JCPOA. And this is from the Danish Security and Intelligence Service saying, there's sufficient basis to conclude that an Iranian intelligence service has been planning the assassination. And this was the assassination attempt uh, uh, in Denmark that I mentioned earlier as well. And so the European Union is responding to this. They implemented their own sanctions uh, to respond to this threat. We have unity on the issue of preventing Iran from developing ballistic missiles as well and addressing their malign behavior and their sponsorship of terrorism with Hezbollah and, and malign behavior in Syria as well. So we have unity and, uh, and it's important for this administration to not only have that kind of unity, but it's important for us to have discussions with the private sector and be as transparent as possible about what our sanctions are today uh, and, and how you must comply or should comply today and what is in store to come in the near future so, so folks in the private sector and our foreign government partners can have time to adjust. And it was important for the president to have that 180-day window where we phased in the reimposition of the new sanctions to give precisely the, the private sector the opportunity to adjust and to uh, comply for those that want to comply with our sanctions. So we think about um, employing maximum pressure, using sanctions very wisely while avoiding unintended consequences. I think we've been really successful in doing that in many different areas, including Venezuela. Um, and we also want to ensure we're protecting responsible companies, we're protecting U.S. investors at the same time. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State David Payman, thank you very much.